Another tip I would give you moving forward is try to be less ordinary. Every day in your life, you could be ordinary or you can challenge yourself to do a little more. An example is Dr. Cho is a minister. I am a minister with the Universal Life Church. We love everybody. Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindis. We love everybody. <laughs> That's the kind of church I can sign up for. But as it turns out, my niece asked me to marry them. So I became an ordained minister. And then I looked at the wedding vows. And the wedding vows are actually kind of depressing, you know, for better or worse, or for richer or poorer, till death do us part. I mean, ugh, that's all kind of grim. So what did I do for my niece? I rewrote the vows. And what I did is I thought about my own wife and what these relationships actually mean. And so who is your spouse, my constant friend, my faithful partner, and my love from this day forward? That's the way I looked at it. Something more soft, something more gentle. Instead of saying, until death do us part, what about through all our mornings and the years that life brings us? You can be less ordinary. It's your choice whether or not you want to be. One thing I say about my classes is my goal is the one. I mean, if I could teach you one or two things that you can carry through your life that's going to help you, then I've done my job. And why do I say that? Because to me, those are the great teachers. I don't remember a lot of the stuff I learned at MIT. <laughs> I don't use it every day or whatever. But there have been a few teachers that have had a very big influence on me. One thing about me becoming a teacher is that nobody just becomes a teacher. Somewhere along the line, there were influencers. There were people who changed how you looked at things. And these are my great, the three greatest teachers in my life. The first one I'll talk about is Dr. Alona Carmel. She was my writing teacher at MIT. Now, she had a number of physical challenges, and I always thought they were like birth defects or something like that. And as it turns out, it wasn't that at all. Dr. Carmel survived Buchenwald. She survived a concentration camp. And she had problems with her legs. And I thought it was, you know, from birth or genetic. And as it turns out, she got run over by a tank. And she took two years to learn how to walk again. And yet, despite all this tragedy and losing a lot of her family, she was one of the most life-affirming people that you'll ever meet. One thing I absolutely adore adored is that at MIT, people didn't like the humanities. So I could go during our office hours and we would just talk and talk and talk. And I spent hours and hours with her. Just such a wonderful woman, just always cheery. Uh, she loved MIT soon. She loved technology. She loved the world. And we got to know each other pretty well. An example of how we knew each other is there was a blonde in my class that I kind of had a crush on. And she came into her office while we were talking. And I thought I have a pretty good poker face. And then after uh, the gal left, <laughs> Dr. Carmel, she put her hand on my knee and said, Dear boy, you know I think the world of you. But she's out of your league. <laughs> she was actually right. Anyway, Dr. Carmel said to me, uh, how do you want to be treated? You're going to get an A. So I can give you your A, tell you nice things about you, and then you can go on your way. Or I am going to get rough with you, and I'm going to tell you how to get better, and I'm going to tell you everything that you did wrong. So you have a choice. Do you want to feel good or be good? And so she taught me about honesty and integrity of the process of what you learn. Catherine Moran had a very interesting career. She started out as a nurse and then she got a brain tumor, went back, got her master's degree in English. And then she taught high school for five years, teaching classes like anatomy and things like that. And then after five years of teaching high school students, she figured she had enough and actually went into marketing uh, for a hospital. And I told her, I'm going to go, I think I want to go become a university teacher. And she told me, just remember one thing, 
you don't teach a class, you teach students. This is why I give you a break. This is why, for example, somebody asks me for an extension, I just need 24 hours, I say take four days. And the reason why is because then you can pick the time when you want to work on it and that you can focus on it instead of just rushing. I'm trying to give you the best learning experience as possible. Uh, Catherine Moran is a person that I listen to. She, It's really hard to find good counsel in life. And she always has my best interest in mind. She tries to make me a better person, and she has made me a better person. In fact, I thought so much of her, I married her. Catherine Moran is my wife. Marilyn Katz was my junior high school science teacher. And what she did is one lunchtime, she pulled me out of lunch, and it was just me and her talking. And first, we just talked about these experiments that I was running. And so here I am, this 13-year-old kid. And then she said to me, I worry about you. Now, Ms. Katz liked to teach biology. And she was telling me about how, you know, from the electron to the universe, how everything was connected. But the greatest joy that we have in life is what we get through people. And what she was afraid with me is that I had a tendency to distance myself from people. Like, for example, during assemblies, while everybody would be like cheering or something like that, I'd be sitting there reading Proust. <laughs> uh, and she said to me, look, I know you're a smart kid and you're going to go on and do amazing things. But what I really fear for you is that you're going to miss out on life and you're going to miss out on the joy in life and that's people. And so being able to be a part of people is such an important part of life. So you know, keep this in mind. And yeah, inherently I, I still don't like people <laughs> to a large extent, but this is what she taught me. I'm, I'm an introvert. It's hard for me to be extroverted. But what I do do is I observe and I listen. And because of what she told me, I, be, I tend to be very good at it. And to really, really listen to people and see what they're saying. And it's just extraordinary, the stories you get, the things that you see. Just amazement on um, what creation has to offer. And so these are my great teachers. I had the teacher who taught me how to listen to you, the teacher who taught me to care about you, and the teacher who told me to be honest with you. Those are my influences, and that shapes how I teach today. I hope you find a way to stay together. The thing about, for those of you who choose to be innovators or break new paths, it's actually a very lonely experience because you're the only person. Now for me, I, I don't really get lonely. And the reason why is being introverted, I can always retreat into my mind and I talk to people. Uh, I think it's also called mental illness. <laughs> but the one thing I do understand is what it means to be alone, where you have nowhere to turn. And that said, and growing up in New Jersey, there was a group of friends I had, we grew up together. And then all of a sudden we lost one and then you go to a funeral and then we lose another and I go to a funeral. And then after a while, by the time I reached 27, I was the last one left. The one thing I had that saved me was my academics. And the thing I've come to appreciate is those people along the way who will help you and uh, watch your back. And so for those of you who have met others in your other courses or whatever, I hope you can find a way to stay together and support each other. And this is a question everybody asks me every semester. Are you going to quit, Dr. Cho? And I do think about it. Every year I think about, you know, should I get out of this game and get into a new game? And actually, this is the biggest reason why I don't. I have eight grandkids. And I just adore watching him grow up. And the little girl on the right, oh, she's certifiably crazy. She comes running up to me and just punches me and then goes running off laughing. Uh, but I just adore her. And uh, she runs up to me yelling grandpa, and it just makes my day. 
And so this is one of the big reasons why I don't go back. Because one thing I know about when I work, I need to be laser focused and I tend to ignore the rest of the world. And at this point in my life, this is what makes me happy. And so your career may not be where you find your joy and that's okay. One thing I like about ASU is ASU and especially the poly school is about teaching. I didn't want to become a research professor. I hated MIT. And the reason why I hated MIT is you can never talk to anybody. I mean, the professors were always so busy. And then they had this wall of grad students outside of them. And then you had to get past them to get to anyone. And it was just difficult. I, I didn't want that. I wanted to teach. I wanted to talk to students. Subsequently, some of the alumni, I'm still in contact with them. Some have been to my house for dinner. And our relationship doesn't have to end here. It's up to you. But if you need me, I'll be there for you. And so I offer you a host of many different things <laughs> that I can share with you. But anyway, Dr. Cho is here for you. And finally, to wrap all this up, one of the most pathetic people on earth are doctoral students. And it's because doctoral students just look at their education as, please, please, just let me graduate. And this is what happens with doctoral students. They graduate, and then all of a sudden they realize, oh, wait a minute, I got most of my life to live yet. <laughs> And that's why a lot of doctoral students don't stay at their jobs because they suddenly realize that they don't know what they're doing. And as you go through school, and I know it's difficult and your lives are difficult, but take some time out to enjoy it. One thing they say about becoming an older person is they say, oh, time moves so quickly and, you know, you reach the end. And for me, as I've gotten older, time hasn't changed. And the reason why is I've always been a person and I get this from, and I probably learned it from Ms. Katz, is that to observe things and to enjoy it. I enjoy here in Arizona in the fall. I take a moment to stop and look at the sunsets, the beautiful pinks and the oranges and the blues. It's just extraordinary. I take time out when I watch my wife sleep. I have appreciation that she's there watching my grandchildren sleep, listening to uh, my granddaughter sing creation itself and so my last comment to all of you is enjoy your ride you only get to go on it once <laughs>